I hope you enjoyed this episode brought to you by our sponsors at Whoop. You can save 15% off your purchase when you go to whoop.com and use the code IT at checkout. Now enjoy the episode. Hey everybody, welcome to Impact Theory. Today's guest is Russell Brunson. He's the CEO and co-founder of ClickFunnels, which is now the fastest growing non-venture-backed software company in the world with a following of roughly 2 million entrepreneurs. Along with his partner, he took ClickFunnels from zero to roughly $100 million in revenue in just three short years. And on top of all of that business success, he's also an accomplished author and an extraordinary state champion, all-American American wrestler who finished his college career as one of the top 10 wrestlers in the country. Russell. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. <laughs> Dude, it's, it's really cool to have you here. Obviously, we've gotten to know each other uh, from our trips to Puerto Rico. And, um, and I have to say, I'm very impressed with what you've accomplished. And given what everybody is going through right now, I wanted to start with some of the lessons that you actually learned in wrestling. Um, you've talked a lot about hard work and what you learned through the process um, one, what makes you good at wrestling? I think that's where I want to start. So, um, it's funny cause I don't, um, I know that I wasn't ever the best athlete, um, but I am super grateful for a dad who was really good at like, um, like watching what I would, what I would do and how like mistakes I'd made and sitting down with me and like figuring out how to fix things. I was never like the guy who was undefeated. I was never the guy who, who won every match. I was the guy who would, who would lose a match. And come back and we sit down and we figure out what was like were the mistakes, what adjustments we need to make, and we'd practice, we practice, we practice, the next time we'd go out, we'd win. And so I think that's kind of what made me a, a great wrestler. That is awesome, dude. I love that story. I love the way that um, you know, when if somebody wins just from the jump, they're sort of naturally gifted. One of the things about um, Bo Jackson that I always found sort of heartbreaking is when you ask him, like, what made you so good? He's always like, I'm just naturally talented. And I always, found that, I always found that crushing because it's like, I'm not naturally talented. So for me, everything has sort of been the scramble of trying to learn. But I went through this, that, that period you talk about of this sort of devastation where you expected to kill it and then you lose and you're like, oh shit. I went through that in film school where, dude, I thought I was just going to um, dominate. I thought that I was a natural born filmmaker. And look, I had my fears that maybe I wasn't, but like I was sort of cruising on this, you know, um, I'm good at this. I have natural talent. And then I really got faced with the fact that I wasn't naturally talented. And in fact, at the time, I didn't have really any talent for this thing that I loved at all. And so my life, one, I went through a really dark period because this is all before mindset and stuff like that. That that word had not entered my vocabulary <laughs> at all at the time. And so I had no sense of, oh, I can build myself up. I can get better. Um, so it's rad that your dad really helped you, you know, focus on improvement and getting better. Um, talk to me a little bit about, because uh, talk to me about discipline is where I was headed, because I think that what we're going to see in through COVID-19 and the crisis and what I think is going to happen to the economy, which is, is going to be less than ideal. It's going to be somewhere between less than ideal and <laughs> catastrophic. Uh, and so I think what the people who are going to win are the people that are going to be able to start over. And one thing that you've talked a lot about, you certainly talk about um, in your newest book, uh, Traffic Secrets, is understanding that, look, some things could just go away overnight. And how you respond to that is going to be really, really um, essential. So what's the role of discipline in your life? Um, how can people get more of it in their own lives? Yeah, I think um... – Man, I've been thinking a lot about it because I have, you know, obviously I help uh, work with a huge entrepreneur or community of entrepreneurs and like a lot of them are freaking out right now for, you know, all the, all the normal reasons. And uh, what's been interesting is watching a lot of them who just have like frozen up right now where it's like, ah, I don't know what to do. And as I work them and talk through it with, with a whole bunch of them, it's like understanding that so many of them uh, are so scared of like failure or so scared of <clears throat> whatever the next thing is that they never, they're not willing to like, to take the step. And so they're just frozen, which is like the worst, the worst possible thing. And I think um, one of the most valuable things I got out of wrestling that that ties back to this was like um, when you're wrestling, you step on the mat and when you lose, it's like I lost this match. But no one ever says like I'm a loser. They're like I lost this match. Let me go figure out what I need to do to, to win next time. Whereas it seems like with business, so many people have it tied to their identity and to their to everything that when they lose, they say I'm a loser. And it's because of that, like they're scared to lose. They don't want to feel like a loser. They're scared of. You know, they, they have a dream or a vision. They're scared that if they try and it fails, that the dream will disappear. And I think I think the biggest thing um, 
that's helped me throughout this. I think that I think most people need to to have is just is going in with the expectation of like it's okay if I lose, it's okay if I fail. Like it doesn't mean I'm a failure. It means like this the, the situation failed. But then when you when you detach yourself from that, then it's so much easier to be like, okay, what was wrong? What do I need to tweak and go out and try it again and try it again and try it again? Because um, so many people are just so frozen right now. And I think that's the that's the biggest thing I think with mindset is just helping people to detach um, the the consequences of of it, the failure being their own and as opposed to failure being being like a match, like a thing that just that failed that you can go back and fix and and figure out the next step with. If that makes sense. It does. One thing. So, um, I wrestled exactly one time in my life. It <laughs> was for, uh, I want to say what's, what's a normal, um, round three minutes. Uh, in high, in high school, it's like two, 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 yeah, two minutes. Okay. So probably two minutes then. And it was, I'm not joking. It was the single most physically exhausting thing I've ever done in my life. It felt like I was fighting to survive. I ended up, so this was back in middle school. I, this is before MMA. I end up putting, um, the guy in a headlock and basically just trying to choke him. Cause I was so fucking tired. I was like, dude, I have to do something like I'm dying over here. Joking and, out. uh, and so in that I realized, yo, people that get good at this, this shit is inhuman. So what, <laughs> what I want to know is how do you like pain? So there's an awesome quote. I wish I remember who said it, um, but fatigue makes cowards of us all. And I think mm -hmm. that people, people are going to face fatigue in this, like the having to get up and try and try and try again. Um, if they've lost their job, the thought of rebuilding, imagine somebody in their fifties losing their job now. And they're like, yo, I've got to rebuild. Like, I'm fucking tired. I, the thought of having to start from scratch is, is bordering on unbearable. What, what did you discover about yourself, about the human animal in, in building up that kind of conditioning where it's all on the line, dude? Everybody is watching you. You're there in the middle of a ring. You were literally in a skin tight <laughs> outfit, dude. There is nowhere to hide. And you've got to pull it out. Like, one thing that to me, the ability to suffer is one of the most powerful things that an entrepreneur can build. Um, mm -hmm. Translate that for me from from the physical to the business world. Yeah, it, um, man, the story that popped in my head when you started saying that was I remember um, uh, it was in high school. I can't remember which which year it was, but I remember um, you know every single every single week we had to cut weight. So we come in and I weigh like one sixty on Monday morning, and I got to be one thirty by Thursday, right? So it's like every morning you come, every week you come in, you're yeah. like. Oh, and so you put the plastics on and the sweats on and all this stuff and you start running and cutting weight. I remember it was after like a really, really hard practice. I hadn't eaten or drinking much that whole week and just beat up. And I remember our coach pulled us all out into this like dark hallway kind of behind the gym and he had this conversation with us about attitude. And I remember, I don't remember the whole conversation. I just remember him saying that like, like no matter what happens, you're going to make weight. No matter what happens, it's going to suck. No matter what happens, like you have to go through this process. So the only thing you can, you can really affect is your attitude. So you can have a good attitude or a bad attitude. I remember that night laying there in bed just thinking like, oh, like I have been like having the worst attitude ever. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I'm tired. I'm worn out. Um, and I remember the next day I, I came in. I put my sweats on, put my plastics on, put everything on, you know. And before everyone showed up, I was out there jump roping. And I decided I'm, like, I'm going to have a smile on my face, like the biggest smile I possibly can have. And so I started to smile. And also my teammates start coming in and they're all like just, you know, like how I felt. But I was like I was smiling. I'm jumping rope. They're like, Brunson, why are you so happy? Why are you smiling? And I, I remember all I said, I, the thing popped in my head. I was like, I don't know, but I've never seen someone lose with a smile on their face. So I'm going to smile from now on. Wow, and I just kept going. the chills. <laughs> and so uh, that became a thing. And uh, my other teammates started doing that where we come out there and we would like, as the, and the more pain it was, like we would put the smile on, like just keep doing because I've never seen someone lose with a smile on their face. And so um, that's something that, you know, because – I mean, I've been in business now, I think this is my 17th year, and there has been like the ups and the downs. There's been, you know, we built a company with 100 some employees, and then like one day coming in and laying off 80 people overnight. And then, you know, the same thing, you know, the, the cycles have happened multiple times. And I remember that feeling coming in where it's just like, you've got to lay off 30 people today, and then you got to convince the other 50 that like they got to keep working, and there's a vision and there's a mission. And like, I remember thinking that a couple times from just like, oh, like I, I don't know if I even believe it anymore. I'm so tired and beat down, and everything seems so heavy. And then it was like, but if I don't come in with a smile, like, like that's it, right? And and uh, you can't lose with a smile on your face. So we come in and we regroup and we talk about it again. Then we get back to work and and keep going. That's um, that's a like an obsession of mine. So it's what I call physiological hooks. So there are um, there are things in your physiology that allow you to manipulate your physiology. So your one of the most famous is the smiling thing. So. Um, I tend not to get angry, but when I get angry, I stay angry. And so I had actually 
early in my marriage that ended up being like a lot of wasted time. I would get angry with something Lisa did that, that she would even agree that I was justified in being angry. But at the end of the day, I just thought it doesn't serve me. I just wasted all this time being pissed off. Like you said, you control your attitude. So I wrote this letter to myself and I said, Hey me, it's me. You have no ulterior motive, but you know what the studies say. If you force yourself right now to laugh out loud, it will change your neurochemistry. And this is something that I think people in, in this time are really going to have to be thoughtful about is, all right, I've got to take control of my neurochemistry. I've got to take control of the way that I feel because if I feel terribly like your friends coming in to practice and they're just moping about, they're exhausted, um, then that practice is going to be worse than it could have been if they had forced themselves into a positive mental state. Um, and then the performance is going to be worse because the practice was worse. And like that, to me, that's not about wrestling. That's about life. That's about being the human animal. Um, why do you think like you were able to translate? Like this is something I see a lot. You look at Arnold Schwarzenegger and all the success he had in bodybuilding, he was able to translate into other areas of his life. The success that you had early in wrestling, you've obviously been able to translate. What What's sort of the secret for you to to the level of success you've had. You know, it's, it's interesting how similar uh, my wrestling mindset and, and business is. And it's not the same as a lot of people. In fact, I've had a lot of uh, people in the last few years I've kind of rubbed, rubbed the wrong way because of it. But I look at it as a sport. So like when I started my business, I was looking around. The first thing I looked at was like, who do I have to beat? I remember when we came in, there was a software company that was like, all right, that's our competitor. And it was like, I wasn't quiet about it. I made known to myself, to my team, to my entire community, like we're going to beat them. And then we went after them aggressively and aggressively. And, and, uh, just like I would, if I was going to be wrestling or competing against them, I like, I reverse injured everything they did. I figured out what they were doing, why they're doing. I listened to every podcast interview the founder was on and I don't understand his mindset and what he was doing. And we, we just like relentlessly pursued them until we caught them and then we passed them. And after we passed them, then I was like, it's funny because uh, I was like, I need something new to go after. And then there was another company that was bigger than, than them. And I was like, okay, that's the next company. We started going after them. And the same thing, I pursued them and like looked at them, reverse engineered what they were doing and how they were doing it, why they were doing it, and trying to figure it out. And I remember as we started getting closer and closer to them, uh, the CEO of that company called me one day. And uh, he was like, he's like, why are you so upset? at Like, why do you hate me and hate our company so much? Uh, I, and it kind of caught me off guard. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, he's like, you are out there always like trying to like, you know, do all these things to, to, to beat us. And I was like, Oh, I don't hate you guys at all. Like, I have so much respect. Like, I know more about you than I think you do. Like, I understand what you do and why you do it. At a level I don't believe you do. Like, I don't. I don't hate you at all. But, but you're my competitor. Like, you're who I chose. And I have to beat you. Like, that's that's how it works. And he was like, I remember he came back and he was like, I. He's like, I wasn't really an athlete, so I'm not used to that. Like, he's like, it's interesting. I always thought you mad. You were mad at us. You hated us. And I was like, no. Like, and it reminded me of the scene in uh, my favorite movies, uh, The Dark Knight, where at the very end, when the Joker's falling off the 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 cliff, and Batman asks him, he's like. He's like, why are you trying to kill me? And the Joker starts laughing. He's like, I'm not trying to kill you. He's like, he's like, without you, like, there's no me. Like, I can't do what I do without you. And I feel like that that's been such my mindset. And in fact, you know, that we passed that company. And it's like, hey, who's the next people? And we found who they are. And I'm studying them and understanding them at a deeper level. And like, and so for me, it's I don't think I could be in business where it's just a business just to to grow or I don't know without a without a goal or purpose or, or something to, to strive towards and, and to move, move, move forward. I was, I remember reading, um, I think it was Napoleon Bonaparte said something about, um, what man will do for a, for a scrap of ribbon. I feel like maybe that's like in wrestling, that's what it was for me. Like I had to, like, I had to go and I went to as a state champ and then I was an all American. Like I kept going for the, whatever the next scrap of ribbon I had to get it. And I feel like in business, it's the same thing for me. It's just like, it's a game, there's competitors and we're trying to figure out the landscape where we fit in and how we, how we pursue and how we go after them. Dude, I think that is genius. So as somebody, I didn't like being competitive when I was younger because I was afraid I was going to lose. And of course, I didn't want to say that. So I was just saying, or I may not even have understood it if I'm completely honest. There was just, it triggered some something in me, which I would now recognize as insecurity, which I can now articulate as I had this fear of having proof, empirical data that I wasn't good enough, which of course is my <laughs> biggest fear when I was a kid. And now getting into business and realizing, yo, motherfucker, like you've got to be going hard. And this is like, look, I like you. I would be shocked if somebody was was interpreting my competitiveness, my desire to win as hate. But it it is what I call the dark side. It is a dark energy, <laughs> right? There's the light side, which is the beautiful things I want to create and the gratitude I have for what I have in my life and all of that. And it's amazing. But then there's also the competitive side of wanting to win, of saying, look, I'm going after that person. And the people who, so I'm not a sports guy, but like, 
because of my mentality, I constantly find myself drawn to athletes. So I'll use that, that language, but please don't mistake me for an athlete. Um, <laughs> but, you know, when you talk to the guys that are really, really great and you look at the amount of tape they watch, like how they study their competitors, they study themselves, they stare nakedly at their inadequacies. It, it, dude, there's something there. And the fact that people don't put in that time and energy to learn what is going on is crazy. The, the amount of insights you'll get are extraordinary. And that to me is, is the power. So as we go into um, this, which probably is going to be a recession, might be a depression, um, how do you think about overcoming the obstacles that are going to come your way? How do you avoid falling into the trap of thinking that you know everything already? Like, how do you stay nimble? Um, that's a good question, especially when, you know, at this point, our company's so big that you have a lot of friends who are solo entrepreneurs and they're able to be nimble because like it's just them and they can, you know, but now we've got 400 plus employees and it's a it's harder to be to be nimble, I think. It's been interesting because I've been trying to trying to figure that out. And, um, you know, one of our, our uh, mutual friends, Dean Graciosi, I talked to him about this a lot as everything started hitting, things started shifting. And uh, and I remember watching him because I again, I'm I'm kind of a marketing nerd. So I remember when I was in high school, I used to sit back and I would watch info. Like I remember I watched Dean on infomercials back when I was a kid and like I would take notes. I'm like, whoa, I like the way he said things. Um, and I remember watching um, as it came up to like the last big recession, <clears throat> watching all Dean's infomercials. And at the time there was probably. I don't know, 30 different get rich in real estate infomercials on TV. Like anyone who ever flipped a house in their life were like, I'm an infomercial guru and teaching people how to do it, right? And uh, and then the recession hit and, and the housing market crashed and it went from like 50 infomercial gurus to like three down to one and then there was just Dean. And Dean continued running infomercials the entire thing and then, uh, and then, and then beyond. And I remember, I didn't know him at the time, but I remember watching it and just being interested how like he, he was the only one still on. And so I asked him later, how in the world did you – did you survive when everyone else got got crushed? And he said something super profound. He's like, he's like, I didn't shift, I didn't shift um, my product. I mean, my product was still the same. He's like, I shifted how I marketed my product. He said everyone else was speaking very aspirational, like how do we, how do we create these things? You know, how do we, how do we get rich? How do we make money? Like, things like that. And he's like, I shifted from being aspirational to to looking at my business more as like a life preserver. Like, like how do you how do you protect yourself and how this product can can protect you? And uh, and so as we started coming into this thing, I realized the same thing. Like. Um, in fact, I talk a little bit about in traffic secrets. I talk about, um, the fact that when any customer is coming to you, they're, they're either moving towards you, they're, they're moving towards you in one or two directions, either they're moving towards pleasure or they're moving away from pain, right? It's like, they're coming to me cause they want to start a business. They want to get rich or they want to make money or they want to whatever, or they're coming to me cause like I hate my boss. I need to get out of this pain. Like it's just a miserable, I need to, I need to get out of pain. And if you look at the economy over the last, you know, seven or eight years, most, because for most people it's been pretty good. Most people that are buying any product or service, whether it be fitness, health, you know, business, uh, anything for that matter, it's like they're buying it because they're trying to move towards pleasure. But you know, a couple of weeks ago, everything shifted where people are all in pain now. And I think the companies are going to survive and be nimbler ones to understand how to shift their messaging. Where it's like, how can how can the product or the service I sell, how does it get somebody out of pain? And that's the marketing and the messaging people need and they want right now. And uh, it's funny because like as I was launching the the traffic, I, I literally we launched the book the same day that President Trump told everyone to go home. And if you look at like my marketing campaign ahead of time, it was like, you know, how we built this hundred hundred million dollar year company and how traffic, how much traffic we get, all these things. And then I was like, that is the wrong message right now. And so we we literally like with my team, I'm like, all right, everything, every ad we've written, every pre-sale, every video, like just delete them all. We're redoing everything. And like this is the messaging. The messaging is, and we start talking about. Uh, I got a, a buddy down the street who owns a, a local waffle place, the best waffles in the world. If you ever come to Boise, I'll take you there. And uh, and uh, he opened the same day that the whole recession happened. And it was crazy because you look at like he's got his business. He opens the doors and it's the same day that, that literally traffic, you know, usually restaurants, you have you have cars, like physical traffic driving by and people come and they they come and they eat. And he's like the traffic stopped. And what happens to all companies? They just they die. Like traffic is the lifeblood of a company. And so the whole messaging shifted to like, look. Like if you want to survive during these times, then thrive on the other side of this. Like you have to master traffic and customers and getting people in. Like this is literally your company's life preserver during these uncertain times. So all the messaging shifted, the ads shifted, the like the like everything shifted, and uh, and you know the book launch has done insanely well, and everything's kind of come from that. But but it all came from like shifting the message from towards pleasure to understanding that we're in a time of moving people away from pain. And I think that the companies that understand that and understand that shift in messaging are the ones that are gonna that are going to really win during this, this time. Yeah. One thing that 
um, I think people need to be very aware of is where they're at in their life. Are you moving towards something or away from something? So I've always said that people fall into two categories. And I think you're right. It changes actually depending on where you're at in your life, what's going on in the world. Um, but by nature, I would say that people are motivated by one of two things. Either they're moving towards a goal or they're moving away from a problem. I don't want to be broke. I don't want to be homeless. I, um, and then there's other people that are like, I want to achieve this goal. I want to win this. I want to be the best. And knowing where you come from will help you navigate the world in a much more um, sane, inducing way. Because if you're being sort of true to what aligns with you, like for me, moving away from something is never very interesting. It takes me into like a, a very uncertain, a very uneasy place. Whereas even if I'm in the middle of massive uncertainty and I have fears, for me to shift my energy, I need to pick a goal, something that I'm excited about, so that when I'm pursuing it, even though the outcome is going to be that I outrun this thing, right? I've been broke. I've had crazy debt. I've been in a place emotionally where I'm laying on my carpet and I just fucking, I don't have any idea how I'm going to create momentum in my life. So I know what that's like. But the things that got me up and moving were to believe that I could change, to believe that I could grow, to set a goal, to, to set a goal that I was excited about and then wake up every day and pursue that. And that was the thing that it... I think a big thing people have to do is like what, where are you at as a baseline reference point? If you're in looking at seeing all the problems and all the things that are wrong, you're not in problem solving mode. If you can shift over into problem solving mode. So I've heard you talk about that waffle um, restaurant before and you gave the guy some brilliant ideas about what to do. Like, hey, are you sending people text messages? And it's like, yeah, to be top of mind, to remind people. Um, you know, to incept them, but you have to be in that problem solving mode. Yeah. Is that something that you think about intentionally? Is that something you try to train your team to do? Is that, that to me seems like going back to what you were saying at the very beginning with your dad of like, all right, you can look at you at the fact that you lost or you can solve this problem. Yeah. I think it's interesting too, because I look at most business owners and like, I, and I know for me, I did it, I did it backwards the first way. Like a lot of times, we come up with our products or our services, like we have an idea, like, oh, I want to create this thing. We create it. And then after it's done, like now we got to figure out how to sell it and you figure out like a sales message and create that. And then it's like, now I got to go find people to sell it to. And then we're, we're, we're trying to find people. And it's like, it's like backwards. Like if you look at the way that the most successful businesses grow, I look at the way that we grew ClickFunnels is when I had this realization of like, I don't want to go and like create something and find somebody to sell it to. I want to go find the people that that um, that I'm passionate about serving, and then just listen really, really carefully, right? And I always tell people like the the um, the more money you make is uh, will be like the money you make will be in direct relation to how simple you make uh, somebody else's process, right? So for me, it's like I help people build funnels to sell their products and services. And so you know when I when I taught people the strategies here, here's how you do it, I made good money. When we made software that made it simpler, I made more money. When we had like done for you things, make even simpler, make more money. And it's always like. How do I simplify this process for whoever the customer is? How do I make it easier? And 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 so like the mindset that we're always having in our here at ClickFunnels and me and my team is like we're sitting there and listening to our audience. Like, what is it they're looking for? What do they want? What are they struggling? And it's like, okay, hey, how do we make this process simpler? And every good product, every good idea, everything that's that's been a winner came from that, like listening and then like figuring out how to solve the problem. All the ones where it was like, Russell had this great idea at two in the morning. Let me go, let's go create it. And our whole team gets together and then we like try to give it to people. Those, those are the ones that don't typically do very well. Um, no matter how much like, you know, how much push force and money we put into it to try to get adoption, it's always harder than the opposite way. We're just listening to what people want and figuring out how's the best way to solve that for them. And um, anyway, that's like the, the simplest thing is just listening. And then how do we simplify this from, how do we simplify it? And you'll get paid more, the better you become at simplifying processes and, and, uh, and things for people. I love that idea of simplification. That's something. So do you know Noah Kagan? Yes. Yeah, I do. All right. Super interesting guy. And I think one of the things that makes him so effective, he said his superpower is making money. Um, and mm -hmm. what, but what he means by that is his superpower is in simplifying. It's in breaking the process down into immediate action. Um, and those two things, simplifying it, and then taking immediate action to me are the exact things people need to be obsessively focused with right now. Because right now, like first and foremost, if you're in a dire situation, take care of your basic needs, man. Like don't worry about launching the next Facebook. Like make sure that you've got a roof over your head that you can put food on the table, right? And that's where a lot of people are going to crash and burn is 
yo, Maslow's hierarchy of needs has stood the test of time for a reason. Like there are just certain things, safety, security, like get those taken care of. And you may have to do a job that you didn't want to do, or you may have to call people up and be banging the phones if you're trying, if you've got a product that really has value and fuck, like you don't know how to get it out. Like you've got to think like a direct marketer. And this is like where I think my own story confuses people because like I'm so intense and you know, I've got like that raw, raw spirit. But the reality is I'm not a burn the ships at the shore guy. Like I'm a, yo, keep your day job, man. Like when we <laughs> launched Quest, we had a software company. So during the day I was running a software company and nights and weekends I was making protein bars because I wanted to see if this would work. Like you're saying, make sure there's an audience before you go. Like we didn't get a warehouse and start buying equipment until we were selling protein bars. I, I, I don't even think we bought the equipment until we were already profitable. So we were making the bars by hand which was pure insanity, <laughs> making the bars by hand ourselves nights and weekends to make sure that there was something real there. So what advice do you have for somebody who's like, yo, I just lost my job and I feel totally out of control. What can they do as a solopreneur to get like that first audience, to get that first sale? Yeah. And I want to first off agree with you. People message me all the time. Like, like oh, I read your book. I'm, I'm going to quit my job and do this thing. I'm like, no, like, no, don't quit your job and do the thing. Like, keep your job because you know as well as I do that. Like, when you have that, like, the uncertainty and like, it makes the pressure so much higher and it makes it so much harder to like get creative and get figure things out when when those needs are met. It's so much easier to to go figure things out. Um, but someone like it's funny because uh, I've had this conversation with some close friends who've lost their jobs who are freaking out right now, and and I and I try to explain to them like you have to understand that like. The money didn't just disappear, right? Like we're in like this great wealth transfer where things are shifting around. Like um, I don't know if you know Perry Belcher, but he's one of my friends who owns survivallife.com. And you look at Survival Life in the last 30 days has made more money than the last like 10 years combined, right? Like Whoa. money is shifting over there. And you look at, you know, like it's not that it's disappeared. Like people still have money. They're just not going to the movie theaters and the restaurants. They're spending in other places. And and like it's understanding that. And so if, if your whole world just got pulled away from you, it's not that the money just just evaporated, just got transferred somewhere. So the first thing I'm doing is looking like where, like where is this getting transferred? Like what are the companies and the businesses that are making more money right now? Like they can't handle it, that they're looking for more help because because man, all of a sudden because of this new circumstances, everything's just just growing like crazy. So that's the first thing. The second thing I look at is like, what is the skill set that is the most valuable inside of a company? And uh, I've got a friend who's a dentist. I tease him all the time because, you know, uh, most dentists, like they're the dentist. They like that's the most important person in the business. Right? I'm the person who who does the thing on people's teeth. And I had this whole conversation. I'm like, you're not the most important person in your business. He's like, yeah, I am. Without me, they can't clean teeth. I was like, I was like, the most important person in your business is the person who can get customers to come in the front door because that person can't bring customers in the front door. You have no teeth to clean. Therefore, your skill set is useless. Like the most valuable person in any company is the person who we call them rainmakers, who can make it rain, who can bring people in. And so like that's what it comes down to like this book, Traffic Secrets. It's like the person who can drive traffic, who can bring the customers in becomes the most valuable person in any company. I have friends who are so good at driving traffic that they literally will find a company that's, that's struggling or maybe on the downside and they'll come in and say, hey, look, I can bring you the thing that you're missing. It's the holy grail for your business and all businesses. It's customers. And I can bring you as many as you want, as often as you want. The only thing is like, I don't work for money. Uh, I work for equity. So if you want me to do this, I want 30% of your company. And people are like just handing them the company. Like, Here you go. Cause you can bring, you can make it rain. You can bring me customers and you can bring leads. And so like I start shifting, like if I got to figure out a skill set in this market, it's like the most valuable thing I can learn is how do I make it rain for a company? And then I can go plug into companies I like, find a company, like whatever that is. But now you're so valuable that like when, when, you know, things start going down, like I figure like the dental office, the, the two last people standing is the dentist and the dude who brings in customers. Like they'll fire the receptionist, they'll fire the, the, the girl who does your teeth, like all that stuff gone except for the person who brings the customer in and the person doing the actual fulfillment of the service. And so like it makes you so valuable. I think that I'd be aligning with that, figuring out the, the markets, the industries, the businesses that are like booming right now. And then how can I go plug into those and become the rainmaker? Because then you can write your own paycheck from this point forward. And that's, uh, that's really the stability I think that all of us want is to be able to have that. And if you have a skill set like that, you become invaluable. All right. So let's talk about making it rain. So one of the cool things about Traffic Secrets is you took an evergreen approach. Anybody else writes this book, and I promise you it's going to be <laughs> something that goes out of vogue. I mean, honestly, with the with what just happened, it would have gone out of vogue before it even hit shelves. Um, yeah. So the fact that you stopped, you said one of the key things you did here was you spent the beginning just stopping and thinking about how do I make sure that this is something that lasts no matter what the season, no matter what's going on, no matter what. You said TikTok didn't even exist when you started writing this. Uh, by the time it came out, obviously TikTok is huge. 
but the principles all apply regardless of the platform. So what are some evergreen principles to being a rainmaker? So the first step is really identifying who your dream customer is at a deep level. Like most people are like, oh, like especially people that that only have one traffic, like one traffic stream. Like maybe they drive Facebook ads. Like they know like, oh, here's my interest and my targeting and that's who their customer is. But I'm like, no, you have to. You have to go deeper than that, like really understand them at a deep level, like know their likes and their fears and like what they're interested in and where they hang out. And like the, the, the better you understand that person, um, the more powerful step two is. So step number one is identifying who they are. And step number two is understanding that like the power of the Internet is the fact that it gives us all all this crazy humans with the things that we're passionate about, the ability to like group together online in different spots, right? Say we pick health and fitness or biohacking, for example. So there's biohacking. Everyone who's passionate about biohacking, like they are hanging out together on certain blogs, right? There's there's maybe a dozen or so blogs that all the biohackers go, they read every single day, they're part of the, they're in the communities and they're on these blogs. And then you go to podcasts, like what are all the podcasts that the biohackers listen to? And there's a passionate, you know, super passionate audience and they're listening to all these you know, 50 different podcasts. And then what are all the Facebook groups that are in? And what are all the uh, email newsletters that they subscribe to? And so we start looking at traffic instead of like targeting on Facebook, we start looking at like where are all these pockets of customers, where are they at? And we start looking at that like, oh my gosh, there's 300,000 on this blog right here. And there's, you know, 2.3 million to listen to this podcast every single week. And you start finding these pockets of customers. And then our job is, as, as rainmakers, as traffic people is to come back and say, okay, here's all these pockets of customers. How do I get access to them? Like what's the best way to, to get and infiltrate the, these groups. And uh, one of the strategies that we talk about in the book is the strategy called the Dream 100. And basically what the Dream 100 is, is, is not figuring out, like, how do I get 100 customers? It's figuring out who are the 100 people that already have access to my dream customers? So who's the person who owns that blog that has 300,000 readers? Who's the, who are the, the podcast hosts that, that have, that have the, the followings and the people that they're, they're listening to, right? And so uh, one of the exercises I do inside, uh, I think it's page uh, 41 in the book, uh, I have a little graph in there. It says, okay, here's Facebook. And make a list of all the people in Facebook who have your dream customers already congregated. Like what are all the Facebook groups? What are the fan pages? What are the people that already have like your dream customers hanging out there? And then you go to Instagram. Who are all the influencers that already have congregated your dream customers? And we list out all the influencers. And then we go to podcasts. And who's all the podcasters? And so you make this list and eventually you've got 100, 200, 300 people that have all of your dream customers on it. And now it's like understanding that I can go and I can – I can buy ads to the followings of these people, and you should, but if I can like, if I can get to know and build a relationship with one of these people, like a gatekeeper of this community, they can click a button and open up the access to the entire community, right? Like for example, right now, I'm lucky enough to have you interview me on your, on your podcast, and you've got a huge following of people who are gonna hear about the book, and hopefully someone will come buy the book, and it's like, it's giving me access to this huge thing. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting, like, we spend millions of dollars a month on, on ads, but so much we do in the business is, is building relationships with the people who have access to these huge audiences. And then um, what's nice is I can, I can spend more time and energy networking and marketing and building relationships and spending money because if I can get one of those people to say yes, it can sell 100 or 1,000 or more of my products. In fact, I don't know if you've gotten this far in the book yet, but I actually quote you in the book um, uh, from an interview you did where you were talking about when you guys built Quest initially, the first thing you did is you found here's all the influencers and you send them out uh, Quest bars with handwritten letters and you're like, hey, if you hate them, let us know. If you like them, let us know, but I just want to send you some of our stuff. And you did the same thing. You went to all these influencers, sent them your bars, handwritten letters, and then from that, a whole bunch of people loved it, started sharing with their audiences, and boom, it, it, I was assuming that's kind of the, the ground fire that initially launched, launched Quest, if I'm right. Yeah, 100%. And that is one of the most powerful strategies, the, both of those things. So one, are you able to identify your audience? And then two, are you able to um, put together a, a relationship? Like, are you able to bring value to that person, find some way to connect over time? Um, and that's where I say, like, you people have to take care of their needs first because to play this game right, it's not about the short-term dollars. And I've heard you tell similar stories to my own story, which is in the beginning of your journey, it was, or I'll speak for myself, though I've heard you say similar things. I'll, since the language I'm going to use is uh, maybe derogatory, I'll speak for myself. So uh, I did every get rich quick scheme you could imagine. So mm -hmm. when I was young, dude, I was about it. I was like, there was this thing for a while where I was typing for money. And I was like, yo, they were talking about how much money you can make, like, you know, transcribing things. And I was like, I'm about it. Let's do it. And I just tried. I tried selling insurance door to door. I did um, pyramid schemes it didn't i really believed in the product i was selling but still uh not necessarily a good look um and i just i wanted it to happen fast and once i broke away from that and i just started thinking about okay 
Um, I didn't obviously say Dream 100, but really identifying like where is my customer base, like the the people that would I would really be able to serve with this product. Where are they? Right, which is something you wrote about in the book. Niche out, like you got to pick a niche. Once you're niched out, then it becomes a lot easier to um, win in that in that space, right? You're not competing against everybody and their dog. They're easy to find online. Uh, you can deliver a crushing amount of value. So doing that and then playing the long game and building relationships, not trying to get anything in the short term. Look, I'm not a fool. I get that acting in that way and adding value to somebody else, it ultimately does come back to you. Some percentage, not all of it, but like one, it feels good in the moment. And then two, you'll, you'll be able to weather a storm because there are going to be other people there for you. And it, it goes back to the story you told about Arsenio Hall, which um, I think is really powerful. <laughs> Tell people that story. It's it one, I because I have a follow-up question <laughs> about it, which is building a platform isn't the only way. And I'm super curious. Tell the story because the people need to understand the punchline before I can really Ask yeah, question. <laughs> for sure. So one of the I, uh, what I talk about in the book is one of the most uh, powerful ways to infiltrate your dream 100 and get to know these people is by having your own platform. Um, because like what like what do I have to offer Tony Robbins? What do I have to offer you know these these people that I've loved to be you know on my dream 100? Like a lot of times they have everything. Like, I'm not going to pay them. I'm not going to you know. So what do I have to offer? The thing you have to offer is your platform. And I think you know there's a lot of ways to to infiltrate your dream 100 and get to know people. But one of the most powerful ways. For sure, is that like the like the reason why I met Tony Robbins initially, and and I did a whole YouTube video, it's like ten minutes long, showing a, a ten year uh, journey I went on with Tony of helping him, serving him, and doing all these things for him before eventually he promoted something for me ten you know a decade later. But it was like the only way the door even opened is because I had a platform. I was able to help promote him on top of my platform and 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 open the doors. And so many other people I've had a chance to meet all came because I had a platform to to be able to offer him, and it opens up opens up doors you can't get otherwise. And so I'm a huge believer that people should start their own show and it could be a youtube show it could be a podcast it could be a blog it doesn't really matter what but something we can create a platform that you can leverage to to get to know people that that own your 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 customers all right well then let's talk about that so i think we're going to see the death of um an influencer class as advertising revenues dry up um so a lot of people that have been making it their livelihood it's going to i think stop being their livelihood but any time where there's massive disruption, there is massive opportunity. And I think there is going to be a whole new crop of influencers that actually figure out how to crack this nut. So what what are some of the, uh, as the king of something with secret in the title, what are the secrets to building a platform? Yeah, um, a couple things. Like number one is like you have to realize that first year you are not going to be good. Um, when I, when I, I remember when I started my first podcast, it was called the Marketing Your Car Podcast. And I called it that because... Um, I had a five minute commute from my house to the office and I was like, at least I know I'll be consistent. So I'm just getting my phone out and I'm going to click record and I'm just going to talk while I drive. And I did a five minute podcast every single day for, I don't know, five or six, seven years now. I mean, I still do. it's been, it's been a long, long time. And what's crazy is when I first set up, I didn't know how to track stats. The first three years I had, no, I just didn't know. Um, I just set it up and I started recording and my brother would pu- publish them and I'd ask him that people were listening. He's like, I don't even know how to check. So we didn't even know. And I'm so grateful. No, I didn't know. That's amazing. Because because I just kept publishing. I'm like, I'm driving anyway. Might as well do these things. And um, it was about 300 episodes in when we shifted it from the marketing uh, uh, in your car to marketing secrets. And that time we switched the platform. We set up the analytics. And my brother's like, oh, my gosh, we're getting like, I can't remember, like 10,000 people per episode listening right now. I was like, oh, I, got, I had no idea. This is amazing. And we started looking back at the stats. And you look at like how, how little it was for so long. And then um, I remember one of my – this guy that came into my world who's one of our hyper successful students now. He was like, when I came in – you know, I, I started, I, I came in on like episode 300. And I was like, I'm going to binge listen to everything. So I started number one. And he's like, man, the first like 40 or 50 episodes were so bad. He's like, you were the worst ever. He's like, but about 45, 46, you started like getting in, in the rhythm. And then like it started getting good. Now, like I love it. And so the first lesson is like, you have to publish long enough to find your voice. Like most people do like two episodes, like, oh, no one's coming. But it's like, no, you have to like make this a commitment. You got to do this for a long time because at first no one's going to be listening. And that's OK because you're going to be really bad. But it's going to give you the ability to like find your voice. That's number one. Number two is um, – and I have an article here that from one of my friends, Nathan Berry. Uh, he wrote a blog post called Endure Long Enough to Get Noticed. And he talked about – he said like if you look at most good TV shows, like usually you don't find out with the good TV shows until it's like in season five or season six, right? Or, or uh, movies that are like – you know, the third movie, then you're like, oh, I'm going to go back and watch all of them now because they, they've survived. And he said that, you know, so because there's so much content being created all the time, that us as consumers, we wait for the best stuff to rise to the top. 
And so the first reason why you're publishing all the time is because you're trying to find your voice. That's step number one. Step number two is you're doing it long enough that your dream customers can find you. And so it's coming down and saying, I'm going to be consistent. I'm going to do this. And I always tell my people, like, publish something, uh, like at least 100 episodes. And by the time you've done 100 episodes, and I recommend at least like in a year window. So you're doing multiple times a week. That if in a year, you'll have found your voice, your people have found you, and you'll be financially free. And so far, anybody who's taken me on that challenge, by the end of a year, they have done exactly that. They found their voice, the people have found them, they've been financially free. And so it's just wow. like one of those things that just, it's it's scary, it's weird, and it feels painful at first because it's not fun when you're really bad. But then you get in your stride, and then it just, it gets really good. Yeah, I will echo that sentiment. So when I first started, um, this was back at Quest, I started a show called Inside Quest, which would be very recognizable to, to fans of Impact Theory. But when we first started it, um, even though I would say that if we all have some element of talent where we get just um, disproportionate wins, mine is for sure verbal ability. So uh, the more I have practiced, the more energy I put into being able to articulate a message, to be able to speak extemporaneously, I just got disproportionate returns from that. So somebody else might do the same thing. If I'm getting a 1.3x return on my time, maybe they're getting a 0.7, right? So for me, like that's a, that's a pretty big gap. When I started, I, I was so frustrated. No one was listening. I didn't think I was good at it. Um, and I went to my producer who I also happen to be married to. And I said, yo, I look, I'm, I'm running a, a billion dollar business over here. Like this doesn't make sense. I'm wasting my fucking time. Like, what are we doing? And she said over my dead body. And ironically, what the exact amount of time she said was, you're going to do this for a year. And she said, if at the end of the year, it's still not delivering, like you don't feel that it's delivering enough value to be worth doing it then we'll stop. But she was like, I really believe in this. I really think that you can add value to people's lives. So just take the time to figure it out. Take the time to let the audience find you. And of course, now at the time, it was just like one thing that we were doing to try. Honestly, it started as a way to add value to my employees. And now it's become my entire business model is predicated on creating content. So the, the platform, as you're saying, um, I think that's really, really powerful. Um, one thing I, I would just kick myself in the face if I didn't ask you about that you brought up earlier. Um, you've gone through cycles before. You've been in business for a very long time. You've dealt with downturns. I want to know emotionally, you said, you know, you're coming in and you're laying off half your people. Um, you've got to convince the other half to stay and you've got to be tied to the mission and all of that. How have you stayed passionate about what you do? How much do you think about the why of what you're doing? Um, how do you survive those downtimes emotionally? Ooh. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I think anyone who's created something amazing has felt this before. Um, it's funny cause when I got into business, like most people, I think I, I did a lot of the type from home and the selling door to, so like, I get it. Like we get in cause like we want the money and you start going after that. Like that's what the initial draw a lot of times is, is like, I need to make some money and that's start making money really quickly. Uh, you realize how unfulfilling that is and you're like, huh, that was not that cool. And then, uh, and then you start seeing the success of the people that you're, whatever you're selling to the people. And then like that becomes this next level of win where you're like, oh my gosh, like because I did something cool, like that person had this big win and that becomes this drug that's like, ugh, like at least for me, like it's unquenchable. Like I just keep, I keep wanting, I desire it. Like the more it happens, the more I want it and the more, um, and so for me, like that's this thing. And so when, when things would struggle, um, I remember, uh, I remember I like, uh, I use boxers like my my mode of, of communication with most of the world. And so it's just a little walkie talkie app. And, and in Voxer, you can uh, if, if the message is really cool, you put a little star next to it. So my kids said a cute thing. I'll put a star next to it. When people, my friends or clients or customers send testimonials, I put a little star next to it. So and then you can go listen to all the stars you want. And so like when times were down, I'd go back and I would just go listen. And I click on the star section and listen. And I would just listen to like 30, 40 minutes of people tell me how I changed their life, what happened, how it worked. And it was just like. All right. And like listening to that got me back to the spot of like, OK, I got to do this. And then uh, my favorite my favorite quote of all time is uh, Churchill, however long and hard the road. And he's talking, you know, to the to parliament about this, this war they have to go on. And it's going to be brutal. All these things are how hard it's going to be. And, and then in the very end says, like, we're going to, you know, victory, victory at all costs, victory, however long and hard the road. And so whenever I, I like listen to that, I re like recenter myself, like this is where we got to go. And then it's like, all right, we're going victory, however long and hard the road, whatever it's got to go, whatever we got to do, we're just going to go and we're going to go and we're going to go. And uh, that that phrase, like however long and hard the road, like rings through my head all the time. Every time I'm tired or I'm frustrated, I think about the people, I hear about success and then and then we go after it. And that's kind of the the draw for me, the pull. 
That's amazing, dude. That, so that's the third time you've given me the chills uh, <laughs> in this talk today. Um, that quote from Churchill, I've actually not heard that before. And my um, all-time favorite quote is also Churchill. Um, I need to just memorize it because whenever I try to paraphrase, it doesn't have the punch. But it's the one where yeah. he's talking about um, never give in, never give up, not not for any reason. Like you keep going except for, what's he say, good sense or something like that. Like you just go and go and go. And it reminds me of exactly what you were just saying. And, you know, one thing that's interesting about Churchill that I think is very um, apropos of the moment that we're in is – he not long after the war, they ousted him and he was the right man at that time who rose up and was exactly what that country needed. And look, if people are willing to reach within themselves, like this is a time for people that are willing to step up and shine. This is a huge opportunity. How do you think about that? Like it, it would be very easy to see this time as, um, you know, just a time to suffer and get through like when you were cutting weight. Uh, or do you think that, you know, there is a way to reframe this as opportunity? Oh, I think this is the greatest. I mean, I'm, I turned 40 this year. This is the greatest opportunity in the four decades I've ever, I've been on this earth. Like, and think about it right now, people are scared. There's fear. Um, and the people who, everyone's looking to be led. Like they're like, everyone's just freaked out. Even people who are leaders are like trying to find people to lead them right now. Like everyone's, everyone's struggling. I think that the people that are willing to stand up, um, and raise their hands and say, look, I'm, I'm going to lead, come follow me. Um, now is like the, the time. And I always tell people like my, I have a big belief that like the business isn't just like a way we make money or way we, we waste our time. Like I believe the business is a calling from God. And I always tell people like, you've been called to serve a group of people. And like, now you've been called, if you've ever felt that tug before, like the, um, my friend Alex Sharkin calls it the call of contribution. Like you feel this, this, this tug, this pull, like you've been called and there's a group of people that you have been called to serve that you can change their life. But you got to be willing to like do the things to like step up and like the, and there's so many fear. I think that, that tons of people are called, but most people don't don't ever step up to it and they, they shrink back down. But those who are willing to step up to that calling and say, all right, my job, I got to gather a group of people. And with my gifts and my talents, I'm going to serve these people to the best of my ability. Um, man, on the other side of this, they're going to be ones that have the companies that have the brands that have the, these things, especially right now. Like, man, we're giving like it's, it's such a, a double edged sword. Like there's there's all this fear, but there's also this blessing right now. You look at ad costs. Like, I don't know what you guys are seeing. Our ad costs have dropped dramatically. Like we went from spending four or $5 for webinar registrants right now. We're paying 78 cents. We had 17,000, 17,000 uh, people registered for webinar. I have tonight, 17,000, like people are so cheap. They're looking, they're begging, they're, they're trying to find things. Um, I saw an article from Facebook saying that they're going to lose $40 billion over the next couple months because ad no one's buying ads. And so we're coming in and like, man, now's the time we can gather people at a cost that's unheard of. Like, I always tell like I should go back when Google was easy back, you know, 17 years ago when I got started, like it just happened like like three or four weeks ago, like it opened up, the ad cost dropped and it's like <clears throat> I can gather people the cost now I never could before. And so I think, you know, on the other side of this, there's some people who missed this opportunity, others who were like, look, I jumped on and I, I found a group, I've called to serve them, I'm serving them, I'm doing everything in my ability and I'm gathering these people together and, uh, and when others, you know, on the other side of this. Man, people are going to remember who is who is the person that got me through the, the hard times. Who's the person that gave me the hope in a brighter future? And like those are the people they can connect with, and they're going to keep following for, for, for forever. And so I think now is such a, a unique, awesome time, and 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 um, we can get uh, attention from so many people at such a discount. It's just, it's a good time for everyone to start to start stepping up and start publishing and start putting your voice out there. Yeah, no question, man. Totally. I aggressively agree with that. I, I'm not sure how familiar people are, uh, but the way that you think, dude, I think is extraordinary. I don't think it's um, any accident that you've had the kind of success that you've had. Um, so where where can people find you? Where can they find Traffic Secrets, the whole secret series? Um, what's the best way to connect with you? Yeah. Um, you know, if they go to trafficsecrets.com, uh, right now we're in the pre-launch. So we have a, an offer. You can get the book for free. You just cover the shipping and handling. Um, it's hard bound. It's like 400, almost 400 page book. So it's 18 months worth of writing and you just got to cover the shipping and handling. You get it. And so that's there. And then, um, obviously our, my main company is called click funnels. And so, um, that's, that's the other place clickfunnels.com. But, um, yeah, uh, that's, that's kind of it. I'm all over the place. I'm sure that if, if you Google my name, you'll find me everywhere. Yes, <laughs> yes, you will. Here. Google will auto populate this man as you start typing the letters. Um, so one final question, what is the impact that you want to have on the world? Um, it's funny. I, I talked earlier about how, uh, people are gatherers and I feel like my calling is to gather gatherers and to bring people together and give them tools and resources to be able to serve their audiences better. So if you look at everything we do from 
from ClickFunnels, the software we have, from the books I write to everything, it's it's giving gatherers the tools to gather the people and to serve them. And I feel like um, I, I look at as of right now inside of ClickFunnels, we have over 100,000 active members. And I look at um, you know the number where I was excited this company, like oh, 100,000 people. But each person is an entrepreneur, and each entrepreneur has the ability to change someone's life. And I, I share them with my team all the time. Like, look, I'm gonna tell you about one of our entrepreneurs. And so I talk about uh, like Kaylin Poland, for example. So she's one of our ClickFunnels members, one of the 100,000. And, uh, you know, three years ago, she decided to start this weight loss business and, uh, they launched on ClickFunnels, had no, had no idea what they're doing with the books, collect the, um, launched, launched their, their first funnel. And now three years later, they have, um, like I think 1.5 million women on the list. Over a hundred thousand women have gone through their uh, weight loss courses and how many lives like and families have been transformed and changed because of like that one entrepreneur. And then we got like. Chris at chrisbeescancer.com, a guy who goes through cancer and figures out a way to naturally cure himself. And now he publishes on our platform and he's now helped thousands of people uh, who are going through this fear of like of cancer. And not that he cures everyone, but he helps people and like helps them understand and, like all these amazing things. Like that's one entrepreneur on the platform. And then and I can list off, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of names. But for me, it's like, man, every every entrepreneur we're able to affect has the ability to affect a hundred or a thousand or a million people. And so um, I, anyway, that's the impact that, that we're trying to have is how do we gather these gathers, give them the tools and the resources and the knowledge they need to be able to, to gather their people and serve them at a high level. And if we can do that, uh, we'll change the world. I love that, dude. Thank you so much for coming on, man. This was a lot of fun. Um, again, I just love the way that you think. I love the way that you're crushing it, man. I love that you have optimism for the period that we're in right now. Um, I share that. So, brother, I salute you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Everybody, if you haven't already gone into this man's world, do. It is extraordinary. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Hey, everyone. I want to tell you all about our sponsor, Whoop. Life can be stressful. We're all impacted by stress differently though, from what we do at work, how we train, and our lives at home, we're constantly exerting ourselves. And oftentimes, we only think about what we do to stay fit and how we eat, but we overlook the importance of sleep in all of this. Tomorrow's best work though is done by night, and our sponsor, Whoop, is a fitness tracker strap with an incredible app that helps monitor your sleep. Whoop provides the personalized insights to make smarter performance habits from your sleep. Whoop tracks all things sleep, from your sleep cycles, stages, disturbances, and efficiency. Based on how strenuous your day is, Whoop will provide suggested sleep times so your body is able to get the rest it needs to recover. Whoop also automatically tracks workouts so you can focus on your training. Whoop has a built-in app that's amazing, and it has this cool feature that allows you to track your strain from training in real time, monitor your calories burned, heart rate, and what zone your heart is in. The Whoop Strap 3.0 has five-day battery life and on-the-go charging, so you never need to take it off, and it's even waterproof. You can also sync your heart rate to compatible treadmills, bikes, and rowers. And the Whoop membership service provides a fitness tracker for free and gives members access to their app, which provides personalized insight into recovery, strain, and sleep. If you're looking to be smarter about how you sleep, recover, and train so you can be at your best, you have to get Whoop. Whoop is offering 15% off to our audience when you go to Whoop dot com and use the code IT at checkout. That's W H O O P dot com and use the code IT at checkout to save 15% off your order. Unlock your best self today with Whoop. All right, guys, try this one out. Take care and be legendary. The world and even school teaches us in so many ways to work on our weaknesses, to get stronger. And I think that's a huge flaw. I think we just get great at what we're good at. We only need to be good at one or two things and we can make an impact on the world.